Today's talk is on the um, legal and medical aspects of providing care during political protests. And we felt that this was a germane talk given what's happening in the streets of New York. Um, on October 15th, I was part of the um, demonstration that converged on Times Square and was actually asked to take care of someone who uh, was pulled out by two street medics because he had apparently been hit in the head, he said, by a policeman and sprained his ankle. And it was really rather a confusing situation to know what to do. He clearly had been hit in the head and didn't look well, but there were lots of cops around us. It was kind of sort of a frightening and a chaotic uh, situation in which to find oneself. And it sort of uh, rekindled my interest in uh, having a social medicine round devoted to this topic. And I was very lucky that I was able to pull together uh, three people with experience in this field uh, to talk to us today. Now I just want to take two minutes to do a little bit of literature review on this topic. Um, there is a literature on physicians providing care during political protests and in fact even during occupations. This is a literature that comes from the Medical Committee on Human Rights which was very active in the 1960s and also from the District of Columbia Department of Health. Because the District of Columbia Department of Health saw its mission as protecting the health and welfare of people who came to protest in Washington, D.C. And they actually wrote about their experience um, in a number of journal articles. So in the late 1960s and early 1970s, there are a number of articles about this, these specific topics that appear in the medical literature. After that, I think the topic pretty much disappears, <coughs> and when we see the next wave of mass protests, the anti-globalization <coughs> protests that began really in Seattle, it's a different group of people that are interested in taking care of protesters, a group of people uh, who are street medics, and I'm not going <coughs> to spend a lot of time discussing what street medics are because we have a street medic who's going to talk about um, their work. So. Um, the speakers will have asked me to introduce themselves, but I do at least want to give some introduction. Um, our first speaker is going to be uh, Michael Mastriani, who is a uh, paramedic. He's an ex-combat medic. He's worked as a street medic for over 12 years in a number of different countries and is currently working at Columbia University in a research project on humanitarian um, assistance. The next speaker will be Juliana Grant who's a medical epidemiologist who's come up uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, just to give this talk. We really are thankful to her for that. And uh, she's brought her significant other, Dan Greger, who is a mass protest lawyer. And uh, as I said, they will introduce themselves. We're going to try and have them talk for about uh, 20 minutes and then take five minutes of questions. OK? So. Hello, everyone. Heading here to assist. Uh, so I'm going to go over uh, the basics of what a street medic is, as well as uh, how they see themselves, how they're generally seen by by protesters, by other participants in pr um, in protests, by civilians, and also by authorities. And uh, hopefully, uh, cut that short in time for any questions. If I miss anything you're interested in, that uh, that Dr. Grant and Mr. Greger won't go into later. So. Um, we'll start with a basic definition of street medicine, uh, or at least a street medic. Um, as there are various qualifications that street medics hold, uh, the basic definition you can use is a volunteer activist who comes to a political protest or other uh, such meeting with the intention of providing medical aid to protesters and civilians in need. Uh, this is someone who was also uh, equipped him or herself with the knowledge and equipment to do so. Uh, they're generally, I mean, th these are people who are not neutral. These are not outside EMS providers. They're not uh, outside ED workers. They are, uh, they are activists. They are also protesters. And part of what brings them to this is a sense of bringing legitimacy to a movement of their choice. Uh, the history, at least in the U.S., can be tracked back at least to the Civil Rights Movement or a lot of the anti-Vietnam War protests. Uh, depending on who you talk to, you can trace the history much farther back than that. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of the gang violence in New York City during the draft riots of 1862 and 1863 did have trained doctors and nurses helping, who were also participating in the protests. Uh, you could go back to Napoleon. You could probably go back to the Peloponnesian War, and there were definitely some sort of politically motivated medics 
involved uh, in, in battle and protest. In fact, you can liken street medics a lot to, to combat medics in the sense that they share the same philosophy. There are three major things that street medics do. Who thinks they know what the first one is? Anyone? Helping in an emergency, a medical emergency. Thank you. Preservation of life and health. It's the primary objective of all medical professionals. The second two are a little more connected to how they choose to express that. The, fir uh, the first of those two is to keep people active and healthy at the protest. Uh, if a protest starts losing numbers, it starts losing cohesion, uh, and pretty much the, the opposition, whoever that may be, is starting to win. The third objective is to add legitimacy to that protest by practicing uh, by practicing medicine to the best of their abilities and their, the best of their credentials in an effort to, to make a political protest more of a, of a cohesive entity that has uh, medicine as a, as a branch of its ability. Um, moving on to uh, skill sets, this could be anything. A street medic could consider him or herself a street medic if they were putting sunscreen on someone who was getting heat stroke from marching in the sun. Could also be an ER doc who has a political motivation, anything in between. Uh, a lot of people who are interested in becoming street medics who have no prior experience or training uh, have a tendency to enroll in first responder courses, uh, CPR courses, things like this. Anything that gives them a basic knowledge of, of emergency medicine and also a little bit of tactical knowledge of emergency, situ emergency situations. Uh, next up is the EMT basic. A lot of, uh, a lot of people can go through that four month course and become an EMT basic just for this purpose. Uh, above that, People can also become paramedics, uh, wilderness first responders, and wilderness emergency medical technicians. This is a rarer program that focuses mostly on improvisation. So it's very handy in situations like, uh, like protests that change venues and you can't carry around a run bag or you can't drive around in an ambulance. A lot of street medics don't have this uh, training unless they're <coughs> otherwise engaged as medical professionals because of the expense and the time that it takes to put into it. Uh, so there are actually a significant number of people who work in hospitals and in ambulance companies who are also street medics. They generally try to hide their identity by uh, obscuring their faces or not wearing any identifying clothing for fear of retribution if uh, their professional association or employer has some sort of problem with, uh, with their political leanings. Uh, common equipment, uh, a lot of people will try to assemble a street medic run bag. But um, there are also a couple defensive pieces of equipment because they consider street medicine to be a naturally defensive reaction to a naturally offensive engagement, which is protesters versus police, elements of the state, army, other protesters, whatever. Uh, so common equipment can include uh, a law, which is liquid and antacid water. It's a 50-50 mixture of water and a liquid and acid that has uh, magnesium or aluminum hydroxide in it. It's used as an alkali to, con uh, to counter the effects of tear gas, which is actually a powder, not a gas. And uh, that, uh, that's becoming very common in a lot of uh, protests in the US where tear gas is becoming more prevalent, as well as pepper spray. Uh, pepper spray is also acidic. Its active ingredient is capsaicin. So, uh, so alkaline, any sort of safe alkaline mixture can be used as a counter to pepper spray and tear gas. Most experienced street medics will know how to use it and uh, the particulars of it. It can get a little, uh, it can get a little difficult, especially for, for new people, especially when it comes to eyes. It's, uh, it's very difficult to apply law under the eyelids and uh, most people will defer to someone who has more expertise in it uh, in a tactical situation. Um, as for alternative medicine, this is becoming a lot more prevalent uh, as uh, <coughs> political protests gain numbers as well as scope. Uh, there are a lot of herbologists, acupuncturists, um, other practitioners of alternative medicine such as massage therapists or uh, even psychologists who engage in street medicine. Uh, it's generally accepted uh, because street medicine doesn't really have the same protocols that uh, emergency medicine has at the EMTB level or, uh, or in a hospital. There's really no way of telling people not to get involved in the way that they choose. However, they're generally warned by more experienced people that if you don't know what you're doing in a tactical situation, the best thing to do is engage in protest however you can, but don't attempt to engage in medical practice unless you have some sort of scientific-based uh, scope of practice or at least an education. So a lot of street medics don't actually have the qualifications of an EMTB. They wouldn't be allowed to to, to run in an ambulance. But they may have taken a class. A lot of them have been decertified. 
it's basically a good base for any uh, emergency professional. A lot of doctors become EMTBs when, if they're deciding to go to medical school. Same thing with street medicine. It's a relatively uh, inexpensive way of getting introduced to the things that you would need in, uh, in a protest. Sorry, I'm still uh, on my notes here. Um, a lot of other things that you would add to a, to a run bag are things like um, anti-hemorrhagic uh, anti -hemorrhagic agent, such as a styptic pencil. Um, a lot of people who suffer minor trauma, this is a, a good way of trying to clean up a wound in a hurry. Uh, anything advanced, most people know to try to stabilize and transport. This is, uh, street medicine is not widely considered a good alternative to medicine in a hospital environment or an emergency room. This is largely understood by uh, street medics who have been on the streets for a while because uh, this was something that was more of an issue before when there was not as much uh, availability to emergency care in the sites of protest. This is especially true in other countries where hospitals are specifically enjoined from accepting people who they suspect were brought in from a protest. That's not the case in the United States, uh, especially in New York. There's a, a much better culture of care in most urban centers that are used to uh, protest-related injuries and illnesses. New York, Seattle, uh, Quebec is finally up there, although they've had a lot of problems. So most North American cities, that's not an issue. It's more of an issue in other countries. But uh, there are several ways of stabilizing on site. And a lot of street medics also consider themselves decent judges of whether or not a protester can continue. So uh, if someone is, is altered, certainly any case of LOC, they would definitely try to transport away from the event or at least to a responsible ambulance or, or police officer nearby. They wouldn't try to re-engage that person. <coughs> In, uh, in the protests. But these are a lot of uh, things like styptic pencils and law. They're kind of a dedication to, uh, they're not necessarily considered medical equipment as the effects of tear gas and pepper spray usually wear off within 30 to 90 minutes after exposure. But this is a good way of keeping people involved because as with any other medical professional, street medics generally defer to the injured or ill as to whether or not they want to continue. A lot of people are struck with the kind of fervor that even if they had a broken leg, they would try to continue. A lot of people don't go that far, but there have been documented cases, especially in, um, in electoral protests in, in other countries. Uh, so as I was uh, going into common problems, uh, especially in the, United, in the United States, tear gas uh, is definitely gaining prevalence as a way of dispersing protesters. In more closed environments where a uh, large exposure can't be risked, Pepper spray is becoming a, a lot more uh, prevalent. There are a lot of different ways of delivering it. Uh, pepper spray itself, like a mace canister, also a pepper ball, which is uh, kind of like a paintball, can be shot from a, from a gun like a paintball gun, uh, which causes uh, limited exposure to pepper spray as well as dying someone, uh, D-Y-E, not D-I-E, um, to, to make sure that they could be they tagged for arrest later. So a lot of these weapons are also tactical against protesters, not necessarily to endanger their health and safety. Pepper spray and tear gas are certainly not, uh, they were not designed to, to incite permanent injury or even temporary uh, illness. They were designed to incite disorientation and panic, to be able to break up a protest. Street medics, on top of preservation of life, their main objective is to keep the protest viable. So as long as life and limb are not endangered immediately, generally people will continue if they think that they've had a decent amount of street medicine. Uh, environmental illnesses are also becoming a major problem at Occupy Wall Street as it's getting colder and wetter. There are several clothing drives actually uh, to try to get uh, people uh, warmer clothes down there. But uh, issues like hypothermia and other uh, environmentally related illnesses, uh, also heat stroke and uh, other types of heat illness are pretty prevalent in uh, long protests in, uh, in areas where, it, where it's hot and sunny. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about philosophy, and I'm probably going to end uh, the actual talk a little early to uh, entertain any questions. Um, street medicine, as well as uh, providing medical care to the best of someone's abilities, is also about lending legitimacy to an action. That's not necessarily to say that a street medic becomes a street medic in order to serve in this way, but also uh, there's a certain air of respect, if not neutrality, that's generally given to medical professionals in protest situations, just as there is in combat. 
Uh, there are there have been uh, a few cases, uh, rather unfortunately, a notable one is in April 2001 during the protest of the Free Trade of the Americas in Quebec City. Uh, Quebec City Police and other Canadian forces actually did admit to targeting medics with pepper spray and tear gas to further disrupt the protest. This is very rare, it should be noted, at least in North America and Europe. This is not something that commonly happens. In general, street medics, although they usually don't have uniforms, or at least not to the extent that ambulance drivers and EMTs and paramedics do, are generally considered uh, to a certain extent neutral, especially since they are acting defensively on behalf of their, their cohort, not necessarily acting offensively against the police or any other force. As such, they're effective interlocutors in cases of extreme emergency, such as someone being needed to, uh, someone needed to be in transport, uh, sorry, someone needing transport immediately. Uh, so there have been a lot of cases where street medics have negotiated with police or other law enforcement to be able to extricate a certain person or persons without disrupting the rest of the protest. There's no real policy on this, and every different police department as well as every different street medic company has its own little policies, depending on how they act uh, with any protesters. That includes street medics. But uh, they are generally considered... Uh, the best interlocutors between a group of protesters and a group of law enforcement uh, officers who are trying to control or disband a protest. Um, now, in New York specifically, the density of care, um, the red, uh, the the, um, I'm sorry, the, the availability. availability of transport, and uh, and also the, <coughs> the obligation to strategize between so many different departments, uh, the fire department, the police department private ambulance agencies and hospitals make New York a relatively safe place to protest. Although Occupy Wall Street has had its problems, um, not that I can specifically speak with expertise to them, uh, a lot of the possible results of a less, uh, a less well orchestrated response and a less well orchestrated protest along with its own company of street medics, uh, it could have been a lot worse. In fact, in New York's history it has been a lot worse, so New York has come a long way. So. Um, in conclusion of this little bit, I'm just going to say that uh, I think that street medicine is a big part of New York culture, not just uh, protest culture or counterculture, as you might say, but uh, also a lot of uh, a lot of street medics are medical professionals. In fact, there could be several working at uh, at ERs or with ambulance companies that you've encountered, and you just don't know because a lot of street medics prefer not to divulge that part of their identity. Um, so it is. Uh, it's generally respected. It's generally, uh, although it, it lacks uh, peer review and the scientific method to a certain extent if people are trying to find new ways to, to, counter, to counter weapons that may be arrayed against them, it's generally considered uh, a at least tolerable, if not uh, fully integrated part of emergency medicine in places where protests are going to happen. So I'll leave it at that. And any questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Two questions. One, um, are street medics, I think you mentioned the phrase street medic companies at some point. Mm -hmm. made me wonder whether street medics tend to be organized or tend to be sort of uh, individual agents who go on their own and don't, you know, to what extent do they coordinate with each other and with demonstration organizers. And the other question really just you made me curious about more details about law and how it's transported and how it's applied and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, well, to answer your first question, a lot of cities uh, do have established uh, street <coughs> medic companies. Um, a few of them are active at various different points. Uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, there's Three Rivers Action Medics, which has been on the streets on and off since the 60s. Uh, New York has several companies. The Black and Red, uh, sorry, the Red and Black Cross, as they call themselves, uh, are <coughs> actually have set up the medical tent at Occupy Wall Street, which then became famous for Jesse Jackson leading the linking arms because the police wanted to take the tent down. Uh, Star of Resistance is also a multi-city uh, movement, which uh, has been active for several years. So there, there are a lot of companies where street medics can, can seek further training. And uh, because of the amorphous nature of the movement, they do tend to pop in and out of existence. Also, sometimes because of, uh, because of their collective natures, they lack coherent leadership and therefore coherent protocols. So uh, the companies are there to organize, but um, sometimes the Trusting whether or not they're going to be there next time is a little unreliable. Uh, to answer your second question, it's generally dumping on half a bottle of Maalox out and filling it with water. Uh, it's usually <laughs> transported uh, in, in a container as an antacid, so it can be readily identified. 
no one, uh, no one at a protest, or at least no, no one uh, in a peaceful protest, and certainly no street medic, wants to incite the police or any other law enforcement. So they try to make their activity as obvious as possible. You'll generally see street medics completely clad in black, but they'll have a big red cross sewn on their chest or a, 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 a World War II style epaulette patch, something that identifies themselves as, as medics, and they try not to, to obfuscate what they're doing there at all. So they try to make it as obvious as possible. Anything else? Yes? Um, uh, some of us have gone down to Occupy Wall Street, um, and we were de protesting or demonstrating, and um, some street medics approached us and asked if we could kind of join their medical <coughs> tent, mm -hmm. because they complained that they couldn't um, even give out an aspirin or a Tylenol, and I wonder um, if you could comment on giving out medications and um, whether, like, I felt like I couldn't because, because of uh, malpractice issues. Mm. Uh, that is something I will probably leave to a later subject because I'm I'm not I'm not a lawyer. But right. uh, I mean, every, every state will have its different uh, different regulations on this. As for out over the counter medication, I've never had anybody tell me that I can't give something that someone could have just bought at, at the Dwayne Reed. Um, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure that you'll get a better answer from Mr. Greger on that one. Yes. Have Have you seen people get sicker than just exposure to? Oh, not than just exposure to pepper spray, or, but it, inciting an asthma attack or um, more serious fractures and injuries. I have seen an asthma attack exacerbated by its use. Also, if the uh, if the aerosolized acidic powder the tear gas is made out of is ingested. It can be quite harmful, and uh, although I believe that there is someone currently working on a study to see if there are long-term deleterious effects, but I don't think it's completed. Uh, there, there's no evidence to suggest that the effects are permanent, but it, it can be harmful for several days if it's ingested. So street medics also generally warn people in tear gas, uh, uh, in areas that have been tear gassed, to, to try not to swallow until they've washed their face with Castile soap, which is a good way of getting uh, tear gas out of clothing and skin. Why don't we we'll yeah. take one more question? Oh. I was just wondering if there's any danger, like if your goal is to keep people in the protest, like despite the police's use of tear gas and pepper spray, like you know, like if that's successful, then is there danger of like at, like police escalating and? <clears throat> Well, the danger is there. Uh, every police department will have its own protocols generally when it comes to mass protests. Uh, when you get outside the country, that danger goes up exponentially. I'll put it that way. Um, most, most medics know to, to wear some sort of uh, protective face gear, such as, uh, I mean, it could be a bandana soaked in vinegar. Uh, it could also be a, an actual gas mask to try to, to prevent the police uh, getting in their way. Um, a lot of protesters will, will do this, but especially street medics. Uh, I have seen police uh, escalate because they were unable to, uh, to disband a protest with an initial attack of tear gas. Uh, generally not in this country, I'll put it that way. And uh, <coughs> there have been isolated cases of, of uh, police perhaps overstepping their bounds or overstepping protocols. Again, these are isolated incidents and generally not considered trends. So, no. Do you have any manuals? Hmm? Do you have any manuals? Uh, there are a few that have been uh, rather aptly anonymously written. Um, at the end of the presentation, I can I can actually show you. Uh, well, I can't show you one, but I can write a link to to one that was uh, particularly well done by SF Medics, which is a street medic uh, group in Oakland and San Francisco. They've been in, active in o Occupy Oakland, but I'll get to that at the end. <coughs>